Um, but many other things concern us. Should we have treatment or not? And if we don't have treatment, uh, will the bleed happen again? And if we do have treatment, will we be unharmed or, and benefit from it, or might we be harmed? So Sasha Bonser's uh, book tells the story of consulting neurologists and neurosurgeons in the UK about the brainstem cavernous malformation that it led, and working out who was the best surgeon uh, to operate on her whilst she came to North America uh, for surgery, and tells the story in this book of a very difficult decision about having surgery. She underwent surgery and recovered well. But what the book didn't tell you is the story she then revealed in this magazine article, which is that after surgery, she had a further bleed from this cavernous malformation that everybody thought had been removed. So she herself is an example to you of how it is not straightforward looking after people with cavernous malformations. And we have many challenges, even with the treatments that we do currently have to try to help patients. So more needs to be done. So what I'm going to do is give you a few examples of what this mystery C word in my um, conception for today is going to be. And what I want to illustrate, uh, to choose a variety of fields of cavernous malformation research to illustrate what this missing C is, which I think is the solution to the future. So here's one simple fact. If you look at the people with cavernous malformations in the population, roughly 20% of them, one in five, uh, will have multiple cavernous malformations. Uh, which indicate there is very likely to be an underlying genetic mechanism. So you see, you see that uh, cavernous malformations don't have a gender bias, they affect men and women equally, uh, and one in five people may have a family history. So how did we learn about the family histories and the genetic mechanisms? So if Elizabeth will forgive me for showing one of her papers that was early um, uh, in the story of cavernous malformations about 10 years after uh, one of the key papers in 1988 describing genetic mechanisms and inheritance and cavernous malformations. Here's an example of the C that I'm talking about. So how did we learn more about familial inheritance? Which as Connie described, uh, was first recognized with the founder mutation in New Mexico. But what um, Elizabeth and her colleagues did was get 28, all 28 neurosurgery units in France to work together by the professional society to help her team identify more than 50 families uh, in France that demonstrated familial inheritance of cavernous malformations in non-Hispanic American populations. It looked like this was a pretty quick project to do, and it was very effective because it involved the collaboration of all 28 neurosurgical units in France. So we got, we got to that knowledge by working together. So, Genetic mechanisms uh, were understood, at least the inheritance and the identification of the genes in the 1990s that Dr. Many and Nissan and many others in the room here were, were involved in. But there's obviously much more to understanding cavernous malformations than the inheritance. What about modifiers of the genetic inheritance or other mechanisms that may lead them to bleed? So uh, this is something that um, uh, Bill Young, now deceased and not forgotten, um, uh, and fondly remembered by many of us, the fostering a collaborative spirit in the vascular malformation research community. This is something that Bill Young and others brought together um, through the NIH, a, a, a workshop on the biology of vascular malformations of the brain, which with uh, Connie's strategic insight, I think, happened here in Washington, D.C., parked on the doorstep of NIH and, and others to make this happen. And this was a collaboration brought together by NGO Reliance and various other patient support organizations under the auspices of the NIH that developed this nice paper in Stroke in 2009 that summarized the state of play on biology of vascular mal malformations of the brain. So again, a collaborative enterprise uh, that um, many of us were involved in that set the tone for the following 10 or so years of basic science research on carinomas. Here's another example, again, uh, something that you have in uh, the United States, the Brain Vascular Malformation Consortium, uh, a collaboration uh, as part of the Office of Rare Diseases uh, and this network that was set up for rare clinical uh, diseases uh, involving three of the patient charities and support organizations involved. And this, again, was a collaboration of multiple people that were, who were in this room. And from me checking the website, you don't need to read the details here, but this is a list of uh, some of the projects, and it's actually only a small number of the projects, if anybody here from the Vascular Malformations Consortium is in the room, 
your website needs updating because there are very many more projects that I couldn't possibly fit on this slide that are taking place as a result of that. And already 12 uh, publications uh, in, in PubMed, according to my search at 3 a.m. this morning when I woke up in UK time, um, to illustrate the outputs from this investment already. And this could be a great platform, uh, nicely described in the, uh, an article in the Journal of Red Disorders by one Dr. Akers. So that's, if you like, the um, hard science background, the laboratory science background, and some illustrations of great progress that was made in a short period of time from people working together. Um, and then along came simple clinical neurologists like me who address questions in everyday clinical practice. And for those of you who know Scotland, you might know about the daft laddie from Scotland. And the daft laddie is an expression for somebody who you can't quite tell if he's a blithering idiot or a boy genius. <laughs> and it's a, it's a useful act to play sometimes, but some of us actually can't help it. We just behave like that. But it's an to me. And so I came along as the daft laddie from Scotland and said to Colleen and Nissan and others, look, I'm trying to understand the, the published literature on how these malformations to work out what the risk of the bleeding is. But everybody defines the bleeding in various different ways. We need to sort this out because future research is going to be all over the place. If we don't consistently define what we mean by a stroke that we from the Alice malformation. So Daff Laddie came along and sold this idea um, uh, to, uh, to, to you, and we had a great workshop that resulted in um, some definitions, which I believe people are still using today, but they could definitely be improved um, uh, uh, if anybody has any good ideas. So here's the concept basically for the patients and carers in the room, anybody uh, who, who's interested. So this, if you like, is a cartoon of a cavernous malformation uh, with the hemocybrin ring around the outside. And you may find on scanning, maybe CT or MRI scanning, that there is fresh bleeding within the carinoma, sometimes leaking outside it. So we know that there's blood staining in the brain always when you see a carinoma or MRI, but some people have fresh bleeding. The thing is, <coughs> fresh bleeding sometimes causes symptoms. So in the blue circle, you see here somebody who's had a stroke of weakness of an arm and a leg, and you've made a scan, and somebody has fresh bleeding, and they've got weakness, and it all adds up, and that makes sense. Other times, patients with epileptic seizures may be scanned, and there may be fresh bleeding as evidence of the cause of the seizures. But of course, both of those problems with cavernomes may occur in the absence of fresh bleeding. So bleeding is not, it's, this is very interesting, I think still unresolved, Fresh bleeding is not the only cause of symptoms, be they seizures or deficits in carinomas. And also, bleeding, fresh bleeding may occur without any symptoms whatsoever. So this is, by its nature, a really challenging condition to understand, and uh, that's the sort of thing that attracts researchers like me. So we might define the arrow there as asymptomatic hemorrhage, with fresh bleeding in the brain without symptoms. Here, people with focal deficits or seizures and imaging evidence of fresh bleeding as asymptomatic hemorrhage. That's what we mean by symptomatic hemorrhage. And then other people who have a focal deficit but no bleeding, maybe that's a different mechanism from bleeding. Maybe it's thrombosis in the cabinet. Who knows? So that was our attempt to define it clearly for everybody so we could then implement these definitions in trials. And here you see the paper with illustrations and so on. And this arose out of uh, Connie's dedication to the cause and people in this room who were willing to collaborate and think with me around how we might need to find this. So this was published on, the, on behalf of the Angenra Scientific Advisory uh, Board a decade ago. So it's our 10 year anniversary of this publication. So that's the genetics and the biology of cavernous malformations. We talked a little bit um, uh, about what bleeding is from them. So let's talk about what the risks of bleeding are in the future. These are some of the most important questions that patients ask us physicians when they see us uh, in the office or, or, or the clinical. So this is 200 people, 200 men and women. And what we seem to know from a variety of studies is that the annual risk of a cavernous malformation that has never bled is about one in 200, 0.5%. So you take 200 people with a cavernous malformation that has never bled, but one of them will have a bleed over the next year. And as far as we know, in short durations of follow-up that studies have conducted, that risk applies for at least five years and maybe longer. 
So that's bottom line about what that risk is. So how did we even find out something as simple as that? Uh, well, we did that um, in this in this paper by uh, systematically reviewing, looking for all the available information that had been published on these risks, uh, finding studies that were consistent, were fairly consistent in their definitions, and then analyzing them in that graph, which I'm not going to go into the details of, to arrive at that risk. And Helen Kim has recently updated this for the guidelines that were published in New Surgery. I think the overall estimate remains roughly true, having doesn't that it's about 0.5% per year. So as information gathers, we need to keep updating these systematic analyses that we do to give you the best available information on what these risks are. And Helen's finally done that, and it's still roughly the same risk. So that's one risk that we know of. So what about um, risks over approximately a five-year period of not just a first ever bleed from a cavernous malformation, but what about re-bleeding, something that's really very close to everybody's hearts and heads when it comes to uh, diagnosing somebody with a cavernous malformation that's bled. So what you see here on the x-axis at the bottom is the risk over five years of having a bleed. And you see four quite distinct risk groups here. So the one I've just told you about is bottom left. These are people who have never had a bleed and do not have a cavernous malformation in the brain stem. It's up here somewhere, perhaps. The second category are people who've never had a bleed and who have a cavernous malformation in the brain stem. And then going all the way up to the top right, the highest risk group, the risk of people who have had a bleed from a cavernous malformation in the brain stem, where roughly one in three will have a third bleed over five years. Um, these black squares illustrate what those risks are, and the lines through the black squares illustrate how precise the estimates are. So the narrower the line, the more precisely we know the right answer. The wider the line, the smaller the number of patients we have available for analysis, and uh, the true risk may lie somewhere along that line. And you see reasonable separation of these risk groups. So, so how did that come about? That was published a couple of years ago. Um, well, again, this arose from people working together and collaborating. So what we did was we approached everybody in the world who had published studies on the risk of bleeding from cavernous malformations and wrote to them and said, hey, uh, do you still have your data? Um, and some of those people still did. Surprisingly, not all of them, but some of them did. And those who did, some of them were willing to collaborate and others weren't. Um, and those who had their data available from patients who kindly uh, given them their data and consented to them using their data, and people who took it on themselves to, cons to collaborate on behalf of their patients who contributed data and shared their data for this publication, which has given us approximately uh, 1,600 patients' worth of data to estimate those risks. And we could only estimate them over five years because that's more or less the length of time that the study was the minimum duration follow-up in these studies. Uh, there were about 200 bleeds in those patients, and in total, those patients were followed up for more than 5,000 patient years, one patient per year. It's quite a large amount of follow-up. You see here, we had collaborators not just in, across Scotland, but in France, um, America, Canada, China, and Korea contributing to this analysis. It was very hard work, statistically very demanding. It seems like I'm answering a really simple question and we're just counting up leads and counting patients. Um, but clinical research, uh, for all of its easy, yeah, for all of how it is easy to comprehend methodologically, is actually quite complicated. So I'm really grateful to everybody who was generous enough to share their data and who participated as co-authors in this collaboration. And I think this gives us some solid knowledge next steps, which relates to treatment. So with that knowledge, this is the most frequently asked question in my consultation room. And I don't know if, uh, if that's not the case for any other clinician in the audience who sees people with cavernous malformations. And there are many options, and that's why it's such a hotly debated question. Firstly, might we liberate you, return you to being a member of the public and not a patient, and say, don't worry, you don't need to be scanned again, the risks are very low, carry on with your life. And that's obviously a decision that one takes in collaboration with a patient. And some patients make that decision themselves. It's not one that a doctor can enforce upon. Other people might want their risk profile a bit more, and that those four categories that I showed you in that publication enable us to do that. 
to nuance what the risks are according to whether a cow known has bled and where it is in the brain. And then according to that risk, the best prediction we can give somebody, possibly when the brain vascular malformation consortium tells us more about this, what the genetic modifiers of those risks might be. Um, we can then decide what the imaging strategy should be for somebody, and then what their decision might be about their options. Should they go under the surgeon's knife and uh, have their, their cavernous malformation resected? Some amazing surgeons in the world doing fantastic resections very carefully and in a considered fashion. And many surgeons like operating on cavernous malformations. It's quite a satisfying lesion to take out in some patients, but nonetheless challenging in some areas, especially the brainstem. What about stereotactic radiosurgery, a treatment for cavernous malformations that's never been really trialed in a controlled fashion? Um, but it's increasingly used for uh, cavernomas that need to be taken out, um, but a surgeon can't safely reach them. Uh, there are lots of live questions about whether that treatment should be used for cavernous malformations. And then lastly, the holy grail that there was much debate about yesterday, is there a pill that somebody could be prescribed that might stop their cavernoma bleeding? Or indeed, a pill that might stop their epileptic seizures, which is possibly an easier uh, bill to be prescribing for people these days, or I hope that we will one day find a pharmacological treatment that works. So I just want, if we've got time, uh, I've got a, a very quick um, uh, video to tell you here about what the Ferris test for treatment is, because the rest of my talk is going to be about treatment. We're probably going to go up to about half past nine, if that's okay, but we started slightly late, so we can tolerate that. Okay. So the question is, what is the Ferris test for treatment? Well, obviously, we need to study large numbers of people. That's a sine qua non. But the fairest test for treatment is not me as a doctor or Dr. Awad as a doctor to say, okay, I think you should have this treatment and you shouldn't, and let's follow you up and see how things go. Because those two groups of people who doctors decide should and should not have treatment are usually very different. The people we operate on are often younger than the people we do not, and so on. There are systematic differences. So that's why the fairest test for treatment is something called a randomized control trial where you take a large number of people who consent to go into what is effectively an experiment and are allocated at random to one treatment or another. Here, it's a, a drug treatment. And the benefit of this approach to treatment, the crucial benefit is that unlike what doctors do in everyday practice, it results in two groups of people who are alike in ways that you can measure, like their age and their sex, and also all sorts of things that you might never have known influence the outcome of the treatment for cavernous malformations that by this process of random allocation to groups evens them out. It's the perfect experiment and we just need to remember when we all want the best treatment for ourselves and our loved ones that medicine, be it treatment for heart attack or stroke or cancer, is informed in its treatment by randomized control trials. So we stand on the shoulders of the giants, the patients who have contributed to randomized control trials in the past that tell us how we should treat our patients now. This is not yet, this is only just starting to happen uh, with cavernous malformations, but in many other diseases that I look after, we know what to do with patients because of randomized trials. So uh, the other benefit of this, of course, is that uh, we get good care as part of randomized trials, so there is an incentive for everyone uh, to go into trials. And then what we'll do after that process of random allocation is follow everybody up in the same way, let's say with repeat MRI scanning and observing people for bleeding. And then eventually you unmask the code and you realize which pill was which, who was in which group, and you know whether your treatment works or not. That's the thing. So when randomized trials are un unnecessary, there are some treatments that we doctors use in clinical practice that so obviously work, you don't need to do a randomized trial. So, for example, blood transfusion for hemorrhagic shock or DC cardioversion uh, for somebody with ventricular fibrillation, uh, insulin for diabetes. Some of these treatments so obviously work, we don't need to do a randomized trial. But in many other settings, you need to look at the quality of the observational evidence. I won't go into the details of this, but Ian Chalmers and Paul Glasiu, who are gurus of evidence-based medicine, set these rather demanding statistical criteria highly statistically significant result with a very big difference between two groups treated and not treated in a study that is not randomized. 
as a way of saying it just might be that this treatment so obviously works that you don't need to do a randomized trial. So I, we, we looked at the Cavanaugh's malformation literature on treatment, um, at least that is every day treatments that are used in practice, and it's hard for many studies to fulfill this criteria. So that's why I think we need to look across the piece of what treatment to use. So how have people gone about generating the best available non-randomized evidence um, for, uh, for treatment? Well, here's an example from a couple of colleagues from Japan here. Um, uh, and the, uh, they've got a Japanese radio surgery society, and it's a hotly debated question, as I said earlier, whether radio surgery should be used for cavernous malformations or not. But all 23 units in Japan got together to collect some 250 to 300 patients who had undergone this procedure to describe more precisely what the outcomes are. So that was another great example of collaboration around getting the best available information on this treatment in everyday practice. And hopefully that could be an example of 23 units that would collaborate on a randomized control trial to tell us really whether radio surgery offers benefits or not. So moving on from treatment, what should we be doing in everyday practice now? Um, well, with my um, colleagues uh, in Caroline Royal Alliance UK, and um, it's really nice to see uh, my, my colleague and friend David White, um, who is an emeritus professor of molecular biology himself, but also the emeritus uh, chair of the board uh, at Cabernet Reliance UK, who was really behind what we tried to do in the UK to summarise the best available evidence and then try to work out how to move forwards. So the last bit of my talk really is just going to be an anecdotal example from us in the UK on how uh, doctors and patients uh, and carers and the support organisation like NGO Reliance collaborated uh, on, on this piece of work. So uh, we looked for guidelines uh, according to the standard hierarchy of evidence that we would uh, like to apply to patients with any condition in medicine. We found that there wasn't high enough quality evidence about treatment of cavernous malformations available to inform everyday practice, but we set the bar high. Um, not long after that, uh, uh, this is Felix Rosenau who's uh, an eminent epileptologist, the International League Against Epilepsy has taken a special interest in epilepsy due to cavernous malformations. And they, independently from anybody really in the cavernous research community, came up with guidance and they used data that we had um, published in Scotland on the risk of the first ever epileptic seizure from cavernous malformation and the risk of recurrence after the first seizure, which is actually very high. Almost everybody with a single seizure from a cavernous malformation goes on to have a second one and develop epilepsy. But they identified many uncertainties. Um, who should have their cavernoma operated on or not? Should it be operated on early in the course of somebody's epilepsy, or should we be waiting for somebody's epilepsy to be not controlled by drugs and only then operate? And when we do operate on the cavernous malformation, do we just take out the cavernous malformation, or should we take out the hemocytorin, the blood staining, as well as some of the healthy brain around it? Mm -hmm. Some of the common surgical uncertainties for the management of cavernous malformations that are still not resolved, but all of those could be addressed by randomized control trials if everybody collaborated together and got adequate sample sizes recruited. And then there are the care guidelines, uh, which uh, Connie mentioned, which was another sterling effort from Amy and uh, his son and his colleagues in, uh, in Chicago, where a group of us collaborated and divided up the work to systematically look for the best available evidence and summarize it. Um, but I think uh, Connie and others were keen that these care guidelines were practical and offered a bit more than our hard-nosed evidence-based guidelines from the UK that set the bar high. So um, this allowed various recommendations to be made, and I'll just put them up there for you to read if you, if you want, but um, the, the ones in red and blue are the ones that are quite emphatic, and all of the others couldn't really be strong recommendations because of the level of evidence <coughs> and class of the evidence that we found available. None of this is class one, evidence level A, which is the sort of level of evidence I am used to for looking after my patients with ischemia, stroke, and other common neurological diseases. So that, if you like, expands upon um, the uncertainties that we largely identified in the treatment of cavernous malformations in the UK guidance, whilst still leaving the door open, and that's really important when it comes to guidelines, because everybody would like to know what next to this thing, the best thing to do is. But if we all make up our minds how people should be managed on the basis of inadequate evidence, <laughs> we completely ruin the opportunity 
to do research to really work out in a proper trial design what the right thing to do is. So I think this um, walk that tightrope <coughs> successfully, leaving the door open to improve the quality of the evidence in these guidelines for patients' everyday management. Um, a quick word about quality. Um, so this, there are five steps really to avoiding wasteful research. And this is an organization I'm part of. We published a, a whole series of five articles in The Lancet in 2014. It's called Reduce Research Waste and Reward Diligence. And this speaks to the sort of thing Jim was mentioning the other day about the reproducibility crisis in, in science, where people publish something and nobody can reproduce it. Mm -hmm. So if we um, do five things correctly, we're going to result in high quality research. Firstly, make sure the questions we're addressing are relevant to patients and carers. We start with that. Secondly, design our study perfectly. We know how to design perfect studies. There's no excuse for ignoring that advice. Um, we need to conduct our studies efficiently, and that is the endless battle we as clinical researchers have with, um, with many bodies, including ourselves, because we don't have the evidence to know how to do our research efficiently as well as us complaining about regulators being too slow and so on. We dealt with that over dinner last night and made friends. Um, what about fully accessible research information? It's, it's criminal to do research and then not publish the results. We should, everybody should have published their findings, uh, even though they might be neutral or harmful or beneficial. And lastly, when we publish our findings, they need to be usable by others so we can reuse, recycle, and gain from existing knowledge. Five really simple things that 85% of research, when it was a, this was originally assessed in 2009, 85% of research funding failed at at least one of these levels. So any or all of those can result in research waste. So in this series, we created 17 recommendations and how to keep an eye on the global biomedical research endeavor to make sure it's done properly. And of course, that involves lots of stakeholders. It involves funders, it involves industry, both the publishing industry, pharmaceutical industry, device industry. It involves regulators, both protecting the interests of patients but not overdoing it so that things become so restrictive we can't do more research. It involves the scientists themselves. It involves our institutions who determine whether somebody like me keeps my job. Um, and it also involves the people to whom research is relevant, patients and physicians. But of course, I got into this waste area and uh, uh, hot on the heels of these articles was this uh, kind email to me, and whenever they start with greetings for the day, you need to be worried about this email. So this <laughs> article probably gets about 79 of these every day, and I was invited on the basis of that series to publish in the International Journal of Waste Resources. <laughs> and I thought, well, maybe I have got something to say about this, but then when you look at the cover of the journal, uh, you realize what it's about. And then just as I was about to delete it, thinking I'd worked out why they'd invited me, then I reflected on the quality of my research. And my <laughs> <laughs> That's actually the reason that I haven't published there yet. <laughs> so how, lastly, excuse me for taking this one, how, lastly, are we all going to work together um, to set the research agenda? So I've summarized a few really simple things for you about how much we do know about Cavernous malformations, but clearly there are many uncertainties, and clearly we have a very simple framework from the rest of medicine on how to make progress. So, how are we going to do this? Well, Roberto yesterday mentioned nicely uh, uh, James Lind, the uh, ship's doctor, who did probably the first controlled trial of oranges and lemons versus various other horrific things that would be hard to swallow for the treatment of scurvy. But this was a controlled trial. He didn't randomize his groups, and he also had a very small sample size. However, he's somebody who's been named uh, uh, by Ian Chalmers as being one of the earliest to set up controlled trials. Uh, and he's somebody whose name is borne by an organization funded by our equivalent of the NIH, which works on a systematic process of us all working together with all the available information to tackle treatment uncertainties. And what it results in is a list of prioritized uncertainties, which, if you like, is our research manifesto about how we're going to make the world a better place for people with this condition. And this, all the work I'm going to present to you now, is really a credit to David White in the front row here, uh, who, uh, after I floated this idea to him, Ian Stewart, who had in Reliance UK, really made it happen. And it was a Herculean task, but one that I think ultimately could change. Uh, the, the, 
the landscape for patients with this condition, at least give a part of one cork in that wheel. So what do you do? Well, you first of all go out and you gather all the uncertainties that exist about that condition. That's a pretty hard job in itself. Then you need to check each of those uncertainties against what is already known. And then you prioritize the remaining things that are not known and known not to be known. And I'm not going to go there with that analogy. Um, but you need to know that this uncertainty has not been answered. And then finally, you have a consensus meeting and you use consensus based decision making approaches to arrive at a conclusion. And what you see here is uh, it's, a, it's a collaboration really between the patient organization, clinicians, uh, researchers, um, and the people who know the methodology in the James Lind Alliance approach to setting partnerships. And all of this is available on the organization website. So actually, that sounds pretty easy, doesn't it? Well, when we started with these guidelines in 2012 and said, hey, there aren't any randomized control trials or many other high quality studies, we better do this. <coughs> the first step uh, was to approach the James Lind Alliance who said, yep, you need to do one of these, but you need 25,000 pounds for it. So then it took us two years to raise that money. And in fact, I say us, it wasn't really us, it was in very small part me, but mostly David, Neil Kitchen, and other people. And then approached the James Lind Alliance, form a steering group, write a protocol. So that was two years to get that started. Too long, I can see Colin thinking. And then after that, we put out a survey and solicited questions. And you'll be glad to know we've got 2,288 questions from almost 300 people who responded to this survey, and that's patients, carers, professionals, and so on. And then we needed to check those against what was known and what was not known. Uh, concertina down uh, repetitions of the same question, and then create a long list. And that was about 80 questions in eight categories. And then what we needed to do was go through several rounds of prioritization with a final in-person workshop to identify the top 10. And here you see us all still standing at the end of that process um, in the final prioritization meeting um, to identify this top 10, which again is, is published. And I thought where I sort of come to is just showing you, in case you don't know about it, what that top 10 is, which was published in the last technology in 2016. And this is ranked in order of priority with no bias from me or anybody else. Uh, everybody contributing the top 10 uncertainties. And if you read down these, you see the patient's number one uncertainty, like I said to you earlier, is whether to have treatment or not. But their second question, uh, and clinician's second question, and researcher's second question, is to understand more about the biology of these conditions. How do they start and develop? What are the risks of them bleeding? Well, we take that off in the short term, at least, but we still don't know about very long term risks. Number four question drugs are big, the big topic of conversation <coughs> yesterday. What triggers bleeding? Does stress trigger my bleed? Does jumping out of that airplane with a parachute on my back trigger the bleed? Does heli skiing trigger the bleed? You know, all sorts of things that people attribute that leads to, and we still don't know what triggers them. And so on and so on. So these are published on that website, and these questions ring true with clinicians who've seen patients with countless malformations. So if you like, that's a prioritized research agenda. If you were a funder, you'd say, okay, I've got. Uh, Hundred million dollars to spend on cavernoma research over the next five years. I don't think Jill said that. Um, but uh, we, uh, where, where are we going to start? Well, we could start at the top of this list and work down. Uh, but if somebody's got a very tractable way to answer one of these other research questions quickly and efficiently, let's go for that too. It doesn't have to start at the top. And there were more uncertainties. There's 27 that we did do a, a long short list of, and it's all in that publication. So people can use this. So what do I think the future holds? Well, I hope that uh, given that our knowledge is that about cavernomas has only been accumulating since the 1980s, very long-term follow-up with patients is going to be possible, and that requires very long-term funding for us to be able to do that reliably. Uh, registries are useful, and I know they're already being set up uh, in the US, just like the registry we set up in Scotland back in 1998. We need to, we need to continue to understand Happens malformation, so we need more of the same, those top three things. But the bottom two things, which we don't already have, are uh, enough randomized control trials and starting to investigate drug based interventions for cavernous malformations. So I think that's where we need to go. And of course, the CASH initiative is one of those uh, in, in the US that enables you to start preparing to do randomized trials. I have a, I have a very minor role. Uh, in this, but it's 
Miss Myers have been invited, and I really hope that um, we can work very constructively across continents in the future to all lead uh, the randomized trials that will change clinical practice in the future for people with cancer malformations. So my final question really is for you. I've told you what I think the best examples of great research are uh, that have changed the field and our understanding of cavernous malformations to conquer the causes and consequences of cavernous angiomas. So how did we do that? Collaboration. Thank you very much.